The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello. Welcome to Prairie Conservation Action Plan's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Ellie Knight, PhD student with the Bioacoustic Unit at the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Alberta, will be talking about strength in numbers. Collaboration and new technology reveal secrets of the common nighthawk. Every month, PCAP has someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Stay tuned for our upcoming native prairie speaker series. If you are in the Mancota area, check out a presentation by Miles Anderson about sage grouse restoration from a landowner perspective. That's January 31st at 7 p.m. If you are in the Lumsden area, check out Wascana and Upper Capel Watersheds Workshop on February 1st. PCAP will be hosting a presentation about northern leopard frogs there. The speaker, Shirley Bartz, from South the Divide Conservation Action Program, will be talking about best management practices. Lastly, there is still room at PCAP's Native Prairie Restoration and Reclamation Workshop in Saskatoon on February 7th to 8th, 2018. Details for these events can be found on the PCAP website. I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by Environment and Climate Change Canada, Eco-Friendly Sask, Information Services Corporation, Ranchers Stewardship Alliance Inc., and SaskTal. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by the University of Alberta. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time throughout the presentation. All questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now, a bit about our presenter. Ellie Knight is a PhD candidate at the University of Alberta. She is the program manager for the Wild Research Nightjar Survey and a professional biologist with the Alberta Society of Professional Biologists. And now I will turn it over to Ellie. Ellie, can you hear us? I can. Perfect. We can hear you loud and clear. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. You're good to go. Okay, great. Thank you, Caitlin, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my PhD research, but also some uh, citizen science work that I've been doing in a couple side projects as, uh, as well. So the, the theme of today's talk is strength in numbers, collaboration and technology reveal secrets of the common nighthawk. So we'll get right into it here. So I'm going to start broad. As I'm sure many of you have noticed, the methods we use in ecology are changing. Um, and I found this paper that had a great quote that I think um, What's this change really succinctly? Um, where ecological research is entering a new era of collaboration, integration, and technological sophistication. And so I'm gonna use that wording to frame the webinar today, uh, namely how new technological tools and collaboration have helped myself and my colleagues find solutions to some of the problems with studying common nighthawks. So I should mention as well that that paper that I, I took that quote from was actually written in 2001. Um, I'm sure you've noticed, especially in recent years, we've seen a transition from low-tech methods of binoculars and clipboards, um, like are used in Ralph Adel's sort of seminal handbook of field ornithology, uh, to increasing high-tech methods like GPS tracking, bioacoustics, radar aeroecology, ecology, machine learning, and more. These new technologies are numerous enough that we're also seeing the introduction of new journals specific to technological development, like the Journal of Remote Sensing in Ecology and Conservation that was started in 2014. These new technological developments allow us higher precision to reveal new patterns of animal behavior and ecology, with many methods also reducing the impact on our research subjects, in this case, common nighthawks. At the same time, uh, and in part facilitated by these technological advances, we've also Seen an increase in the amount of collaboration within ecology. So some of these technological tools that facilitate collaboration include working groups, shared databases, standardized protocols, we've got all sorts of online tools and decision support systems. And our increased collaborative capacity is argued to make us uh, as ecologists and, uh, able to tackle more complex questions of which we know there are many in ecology. 
It's also argued that collaboration can facilitate conservation efforts uh, with standardized protocols. And so the Piper and Plover is argued as a great case study for the power of collaboration for conservation. So what about Nighthawks? Well, when it comes to Nighthawks, it's generally agreed that they are poorly understood. So this quote uh, comes from the Birds of North America account there. Although arguably the most studied night jar in North America and one of the best known in the world, common, the common Nighthawk remains poorly understood. There's been some work done on the ecology of the common nighthawk, or CONI, as you'll see in my slides for short, uh, particularly by Dr. Mark Brigham at uh, the University of Regina, who's my who's supervisor, and his students, uh, particularly past students, Ryan Fisher and Janet Eng, have made some pretty great contributions, and current students, Gabriel Foley and Andrea Sidler. But for the most part, much of the basic ecology of the common nighthawk remains a mystery. There are huge gaps remaining about migration, overwintering areas, reproduction, habitat, diet, and more. And this relative lack of information presents an opportunity to implement this new technological and collaborative paradigm of ecology to answer some important ecological and management questions about Nighthawks. So before we go any further, a little bit of Nighthawk 101. Uh, they are a nature species. They're in the family Capromogidae. They're an aerial insectivores, so they eat uh, flying insects and they forage for them on the wing. They're a continuous flight forager. Uh, what we know of their habitat associations, we know that they like open area habitats. Um, that's straight, again, from the Birds of North America account. Um, we think that maybe that's because they need open uh, areas for foraging, or maybe they also prefer uh, more open areas so they can see predators. They're a ground nesting bird. Um, we know that they're a long distance migrant, but we don't uh, quite know where they're going and we'll get into that further in the talk. One of the key components to Nighthawk biology is that they're a crepuscular species. So they're most active at uh, dawn and dusk, but particularly the dusk period. And in some areas, uh, they are, can potentially be considered nocturnal as well. And again, really important for today's uh, seminar, they have two acoustic signals and because they're crepuscular or nocturnal, it's often how you detect a nighthawk. Uh, and so those, those two sounds are a call. Um, it's often described as a peat, or I've heard it. Um, some people say that it sounds a little bit like when you whisper the word beard, um, which I think is kind of funny. Um, and then they also have an, an, a non-vocal sound called a wing boom. And um, for those of you that don't know, um, that's a sound that, the, that they make with the, they take a uh, a steep aerial dive from high up in the air, and they're very agile flyers. Um, and as they reach the bottom of that dive, they curve the, the ends of their wingtips down, and as the air rushes through those primary feathers, it makes a, a boom, a really low frequency boom sound, kind of like a vroom. Um, and I was gonna put a, a, a sound clip in today's talk, but I couldn't quite get the, the, the technology to work, so we just have to make do with my interpretation. Um, and so, <laughs> Also pertinent background information for common nighthawks is their conservation status. So they are listed as threatened in Canada under the Federal Species at Risk Act. They had a steep population declines detected in breeding bird survey data from 1973 to 2012. They're also listed as imperiled or critically imperiled in several of the Eastern United States. The hypotheses for their decline remain untested, but are linked primarily to their food source, those aerial insects. Um, because nighthawks are declining along with the rest of the aerial insect or guild of birds. And we'll get more into those hypotheses uh, later on in the talk today. And so I thought this would be a good chance to introduce myself as well, so you know who you're listening to. Uh, so this is me holding the first nighthawk I ever caught in 2015. I'm covered in soot because we were working in a recent burn north of Fort McMurray, Alberta, but I'm pretty excited and humbled to be holding such a fascinating creature. <laughs> Um, I became interested in common nighthawks in 2010 when I started working in the South Okanagan of BC. I found a few nighthawks in the sagebrush hills that year and was immediately attracted to the study, to the, sorry, to the challenge of, of studying such mysterious species. I've been working on nighthawks since 2011 when I became program manager for what was then called the BC Poor Wheel Survey and is now named the Wild Research Nightjar Survey. And in 2015, I decided that I, that I wanted to work more with the data that we were collecting with that program. So I started a PhD with Aaron Bain at the University of Alberta and co-supervised by Mark Brigham at the University of Regina. So I'm not gonna lie. I think one of the reasons that Nighthawks remain a bit of a blank slate is because they're hard to study. 
And so the rest of the talk is going to be structured around four major challenges that I've identified to understanding the species and the potential solutions, technological and collaborative, that uh, we've developed to address some of those challenges. I'd like to point out uh, that some of the research I'm presenting today was conducted in the boreal forest, particularly for the first two challenges we're going to talk about, but the premises behind that research can be applied to prairie regions as well. And I should emphasize before I get too far that this is a talk about collaboration and so much of the work that I'm presenting has been co contributed to by many folks across the continent. And so those four challenges are, the first, they're crepuscular and that makes um, them less detected during uh, sort of standard uh, bird survey techniques like dawn point count surveys. The second is that they're highly mobile. They move fast and they move a lot and that creates complications for understanding their habitat use. The third is that there are lots of other nighthawk species out there, not here in Canada, but in other areas of the range and migration and uh, on the wintering grounds as well. And so that means that there is a lot of confusion about where they go when they're not with us here on the breeding grounds. And the fourth is that they have a very large geographic range. Um, and so we need to understand how to, uh, how to study them and also how to manage them across that range in a consistent manner. So we'll start with the first problem, uh, crepuscular nature. And so I put this photo up because when you study nighthawks, you get to see a lot of sunsets and you also get to see lots of sunrises. And so the solution uh, to that first problem is a technological solution. Um, and because again, like I mentioned, this is a talk about collaboration, I want to be out front, up front with the fact that I have a ton of collaborators on all of these different pieces. And so I've got an acknowledgement slide at the beginning of each of these sections um, that points out all the people that have contributed to that section. And so for this first crepuscular section, I'd like to thank a lot of the folks that I work with uh, for bioacoustics, um, especially a lot of the folks in the Bain Lab that have really helped me uh, think about some of the ways that we can study nighthawks using bioacoustic tools. Okay, so why does it matter that nighthawks are crepuscular? Well, it means that they have very, very low detectability during the times of day when we normally survey for birds, those dawn point counts that I just mentioned. And by detectability, I mean that you have a really small chance of actually knowing whether a nighthawk is there during those dawn point counts, even if the area that you're surveying for is a nighthawk territory because that nighthawk is roosting. It's basically sleeping and it won't be visible or audible. And so this becomes, this low detectability becomes obvious if we look at histograms, the number of nighthawk calls in sound recordings relative to sunrise for three different regions. We've got a couple uh, northern regions, northern Alberta, the Northwest Territory, but then we've also got South Central BC down there uh, on the bottom. And that red line, is 30 minutes before sunrise, which is when most bird survey protocols start. That's when those, those dawn point counts start. If you look to the right of that line, uh, you see that there are very few calls, and that's the reason why uh, we're not picking them up on dawn uh, point counts. But if you look to the left of that line, uh, sort of uh, before half hour before sunrise, and then if you the left hand of the plot is uh, the sunset period, you see that there there's plenty of nighthawk activity out there. We're just not looking at the right time of day. And so what does that mean in terms of the data sets that we do have available uh, for understanding nighthawks? Well, if you look at the breeding bird survey data set, which um, employs a protocol that starts at 30 minutes before sunrise, that red line on the, on the histograms there, um, you see that there are just over 1,100 detections in the entire data set for the entire country, the entire 40 years of the program. And I can tell you from personal experience, there's a lot more Nighthawks out there than that. So why does it matter? What well, means the stated efficiency matters because habitat associations are very difficult to tease apart when a species has such low detectability. And the federal government has an obligation to define critical habitat for common Nighthawks because they're listed under SARA, or the Species at Risk Act. And so on the right is the best habitat model possible given the existing data, which is coarse grained to say the least. So we need better data. Now one particularly attractive approach to collecting better data for nighthawks is bioacoustic technology. In other words, using sound to study them. So we deploy devices called ARUs or autonomous recording units that are basically acoustic recorders that you can program to record at any time of day or year. 
And these recorders have a, a number of advantages. First, that you can control when, when they're listening to uh, the acoustic environment around them. So you can program them to record around that sunset period when we know night hawks are most detectable. Or you can also record multiple visits. So they'll record until their batteries run out. And so that means that you can, you basically have repeat visits um, with your ARU. They're great for rare acoustic species. Um, so uh, species like the yellow rail, they've been found to be really useful for. Uh, and again, that's because you have those multiple visits. So if you even if you have a species with low detectability, you have a better chance of detecting it over multiple visits. They also provide a permanent record. And so you can go back and look at these ARU recordings that have been collected for other projects, and you can look for nighthawks in them. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how we've, we've started to do that for common nighthawks. And then one of the last big advantages is that they reduce observer bias. So um, we all know that, that um, identifying and detecting birds in the field is, is a really difficult thing to do, and it's a highly trained skill. And, and so we know because of that, um, the ability of different people to detect birds in the field does vary from person to person, and that's called observer bias. And so when you have a recording uh, as the record instead of uh, a person's data sheet, it, it allows you to reduce that observer bias. So a little bit about uh, sound. Uh, when we bring these recordings back into the field, we need to process them to extract the species detection information they're in. And that processing can happen a couple different ways, but it almost always employs the use of a spectrogram, which is a visualization tool for sound. Uh, and so within a spectrogram on the x-axis, uh, you have time, and the y-axis is frequency. So lower down on the y-axis, you'll have low sounding sounds, and higher up on the y-axis, you'll have high sounding sounds. And then the z-axis, or the hue, the intensity of what's in the plot is the amplitude, or how loud the sound is. So it turns out that common nighthawks are a great model species for bioacoustic work. And we'll use the spectrogram of the nighthawk call to visualize why. So that's, um, that's the colored plot on the bottom here. And so remember that common nighthawks have those two acoustic signals. This is the call, uh, the one that's a little bit higher frequency. And you can see there's two different individuals calling in the spectrogram. And then the wing boom is below the call that's in the center of the spectrogram. And you can see those uh, sort of those lines that go across right at the bottom of, uh, of the plot. And so that's, that's that really low frequency sound, that vroom. And so in this spectrogram, we can see there's two individuals vocalizing, each at a rate of about one call every two seconds. You can see the first is closer to the ARU because the signal is stronger. So that's the one that uh, called first within the spectrogram. And then the second one is a little bit further and it's calling right after that first individual. So you can see there's a lot of information that we can pull out of these acoustic recordings. Now the reason that common nighthawks work so well for bioacoustics is because of their crepuscular nature. So they're acoustically active at a time of day when there isn't much other sound. And so you get very little of what we call sound masking or covering up of that call signal with other sounds and so you get these really nice clear spectrograms like the one we're looking at and the other reason is because their call is simple frequent distinct and consistent and these features the common nighthawks ideal for another type of boost bioacoustics technology we call acoustic recognition so I remember that I mentioned there are a couple ways of processing audio recordings well the most obvious way is to listen to them but listening takes time. And you can see from the screenshot of the servers we have in the bioacoustic unit on the right here, we have a lot of data. It would take you almost a lifetime to listen to all of it. And that's if you didn't sleep. So we need a faster way of extracting species detection information from these audio files. And the method, that method essentially uses computers to listen to the data instead of humans. So it's a fairly simple process in theory. First, you train a software program to detect a certain species or call type. Um, so I have what we call recognizers for the common nighthawk call. I've used clips of those calls like we saw from the spectrogram on the last slide. And I've trained these software programs uh, to learn what that, what that call looks like. And then you get the computer to scan your audio files. And that's where the efficiency comes in because the computer can scan those audio files much faster than you can listen to them. Uh, and then last, you go through and you look, the computer picks out uh, every sort of sound signal that it thinks um, 
is the what you've trained it to look for and so it gives you a, a list of hits and so you go then you go through those hits and you say okay yes this is a nighthawk yes this is a nighthawk no you're wrong that's a red-winged blackbird uh, and so the, the ones that are nighthawks we call true positives and um, the ones that are not nighthawks but that it thought were um, nighthawks we call those false positives and so we've developed these algorithms for common nighthawks in a variety of software programs and found that it, it actually works really well, uh, probably because of those characteristics of the common nighthawk call that I mentioned previously. So this graph is probably a little complicated. Um, it's from a paper we just published showing how well this technology does work for common nighthawks. And we did that by comparing it to human listening. So human listening is the red line at the top of the plot. Um, and on the y-axis, uh, what we basically have is the correlation coefficient with human listening. So how well uh, does the results from the recognizer correlate if, uh, with the same results that were processed by just listening to the data? The x-axis is less important for our purposes here, but I'll explain it just so you understand. It's basically a cutoff value for what you want the computer to report back to you as a potential detection, or what we call the hit on the last slide. So each time the computer detects a sound, it rates how well that sound matches what it knows to be the sound that it's looking for. So it says like, oh, I think this sound is a you know 60% probability that it's a Nighthawk. And so you basically you set a threshold um, for uh, how well you want the computer to report back to you. So you say, I only want to review hits above 60% likelihood. Um, and so you're basically saying, you can tell it, okay, give me only the sounds that are really likely to be common nighthawks, or you can tell it, give me all the sounds, I want to review all of them. And so you can see, um, as you drop that score threshold, you say, give me all the sounds, then your correlation rate does go up. So it's kind of, there's a trade-off there between efficiency um, and how good your data is. But what we can see is that some of these recognizers are getting over 80% correlation with human listening, even when you don't tell it to give you all the sounds. And that's really good. Uh, in the acoustic recognition world, these, these recognizers are performing really well. So what does that look like uh, when we scale it up? How does bioacoustics actually help? Well, I'm going to show you data from the boreal forest on this one because that's uh, the only data I've processed so far. Um, and so in northeast, northeastern Alberta, on the left-hand side of this slide, um, there are only a handful of common nighthawk detections in the BBS data. But when we scanned over 1,500 ARU locations with these recognizers that I just talked about, we found nighthawks at over a third of them. And that's a lot of common nighthawks that we didn't really know were there because we weren't looking at the right time of day. And so the next step is to continue processing the more than 7,000 survey locations we have audio recordings for in the bioacoustic unit including uh, we're going to start looking at some of the recordings in the prairie regions. And so I'm going to leave that crepuscular section here for now, um, but I should mention we're also working on a range of other bioacoustic tools to help us extract better information even faster than those audio recordings because we've got a lot of work to do. So problem number two, mobility. So I'm sure for those of you who have watched Common Eye Hawks in Flight, you know that they can move fast. Well, that mobility makes understanding their biology kind of tricky. But before I tell you why, here's the folks that have contributed to this section of the presentation. I'm gonna argue on this one that the solution to the mobility is also technological, and it has to do with bioacoustics. Uh, and this section is the bulk of, of my core thesis work at the U of A, and so it's pretty near and dear to my heart. Okay, so why does that mobility matter? Well, it means that common nighthawks can move around between areas really easily. Mark Brigham has found that in the South Okanagan, common nighthawks can travel up to 12 kilometers between their nesting territory and their foraging grounds. Because they can move so easily, it becomes important to, <clears throat> excuse me, understand whether or not they're actually using an area that they're detected in, or whether they're just passing through. In other words, it becomes important to understand what a detection even means. This conundrum is exacerbated by the fact that they show variation in their territorial behavior across their range. So in some areas, like downtown Detroit on the left here, common nighthawks are thought to use a type A territory, where they use a single area for nesting and other functions like foraging and roosting. And so in that case, mobility might, that mobility might not be as much of a concern. But Janet Ng showed in her 2009 master's thesis with Mark Brigham, 
The common nighthawks in southern Saskatchewan actually use type B territories where they defend one area for mating and nesting, which is the cluster that's on the far left in this plot. But then they travel outside those territories to, for, to other areas for roosting and foraging, making it particularly important to be able to differentiate between those habitat functions. Okay, so why does it matter whether or not you consider these habitat functions? Well, ignoring function can affect your conclusions when you're doing habitat modeling in several ways, which Rover et al. Uh, outlined really nicely uh, in a paper that they wrote. Um, so say we have two different function-specific habitats. We'll call, them, we'll call them nesting and foraging. And so function A, nesting, is here on the plot in light green, and function B uh, is in dark green. And so both functions are used in similar proportion to each other, but function A has a positive relationship with a particular environmental variable, say we'll call it, I don't know, proportion of grassland habitat. Uh, well, function B has a negative relationship. And so if we model these two function specific habitats separately, we do see these differing relationships. But if we were to combine them into a single presence absence model, like we do often with bird surveys or with bird data, the slopes would cancel each other out and the relationship would be masked and we wouldn't even see that relationship with, with grassland habitat. So masking habitat relationships is of particular concern if there are function specific habitats that contribute disproportionately to you know, the breeding or survival of a species, um, you know, maybe something like nesting habitat and thus are important for conservation. And combining those function specific habitats can also change the strength of the shape of the relationship with an environmental variable. Now, one of the reasons that habitat function is difficult to incorporate in habitat studies is because it requires an understanding of the behavior of the organism. The behavior is often easier to figure out for larger animals because you can infer it from telemetry data. But it's often usually ignored for birds that are too small to carry that tracking technology. So what I'm proposing is that acoustic signals also carry behavioral information that may be used to infer habitat function particularly for species, uh, sorry, particularly for birds, because many species communicate primarily with sound. So each species has a variety of signals, primarily vocal, that communicate information to uh, other birds of that species about the behavioral state of that uh, individual sender. But that signal can also contain information about the function of the habitat that the sender is using. So in this case, uh, when we hear you know, a lot of songbirds sing, we know that that's them sending a signal either to birds on uh, adjacent territories or to females that this is their territory and, uh, and they're defending it. And so we can then infer by hearing that acoustic signal that they're in a space that they're probably using both for foraging and for nesting. Uh, and so if we can figure out how to relate acoustic signal to habitat function for other species, we can then use ARUs to remotely monitor those species, including nighthawks, and determine how they're using the habitat, which will in turn improve the precision and inference of habitat models and density estimates. So I'm using two lines of evidence to, uh, with, of evidence that aim to disentangle the meaning of common nighthawk acoustic signal and to link it to habitat function. So the first is uh, focal observations of radio tagged male common nighthawks. Um, and so during observations of each of those tagged individuals, myself and my field technicians recorded the behavior of the focal bird as one of six behavioral classes. We also recorded the type and timestamp of every acoustic signal produced by that bird. And so the next step is to take that uh, behavioral data and model is a function of acoustic signal rate and hopefully to create a proxy, an acoustic proxy for habitat function. And so I haven't done those models yet, um, but visual exploration of the data that I collected in 2016 um, suggests that behaviors can be differentiated with signal type and rate. So on the top here we have the calls and on the bottom we have those wing booms and it's the rate of that, those two signals per minute. And so you can see when common nighthawks are in engaging in aggressive encounters or when they're uh, undertaking territory vigilance, they're sort of passively guarding their territory. Their call rate's really high, as is their boom rate, but when they're uh, engaging in other activities like traveling or foraging or courtship, uh, the rates of those two acoustic signals decrease. Uh, and so this sort of first visualization of the data suggests that we can definitely separate out territorial function 
uh, from some of these other habitat functions, but I'm going to need to do some more um, complex and, and precise analyses to figure out whether we can separate some, out some of these other habitat functions like traveling and foraging. So the second line of evidence that we're using uh, relates to the location of those wing boom signals to nest location. So lots of folks have suggested that that wing boom signal is actually um, indicative of the nest itself. And so what we did is we found and monitored nests for 26 of those 32 focal individuals. And for those 26 individuals, we also recorded the coordinates, the GPS location of every wing boom display. And so I've mapped the use distribution of these wing booms and compared the location of the nest to a random point uh, within that use distribution. So this is just an example on the right hand side here. Um, but when you look at that across those 26 individuals in a paired T test, uh, you find that the nest is significantly, uh, is in a significantly lower use contour than random. What that means in plain English is that the nest is in fact significantly closer to the center of that wing boom distribution than a random point. And so that does suggest that the wing boom does indicate the nest location. Okay, so why does this really matter for night hawks? Well, I've done, also done a little bit of exploratory work to suggest that incorporating habitat function into models does really matter for night hawks. So on the left is a really simple uh, habitat model that uses all detections. So it's that presence absence data. And you can see that the model predicts that most of the landscape is moderate suitability, which isn't super useful for management. But on the right is a model that uses only wing boom detections under the assumption that those wing booms are indicative of uh, the territory or the nesting area. And we can now see that this model separates out areas of high and low suitability much better, making it a more useful model. So the next step will be to develop those acoustic proxies and then try and apply them in habitat models to see how much of a difference it makes in more complex models. So moving on to problem number three, the other nighthawks. So there are a lot of other nighthawk species out there, uh, not here in Canada, but on migration and the wintering grounds that are really hard to tell apart from common nighthawks. So this slide shows four different nighthawk species and none of them are common nighthawks. And so I'm gonna argue that the solution to this problem has been technological and collaborative. I've been extremely fortunate to lead this project with the supervision of Aaron Bain, Peter Mara at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. Um, and Stephen Van Wilgenberg at Environment and Climate Change Canada, and also with consultancy from Mark Brigham because he's the expert. Um, and I've also had the chance to work with an amazing group of folks from across the continent. There were too many names to put up on the slide, so I've just put logos instead, but I can assure you there are faces behind those logos. Okay, so where did the nighthawks go? The problem with so many similar looking species on migration and the wintering grounds is that we don't really have any idea where common nighthawks migrate and where they winter because they're mixed up, uh, their identification is mixed up with those other species. So on the left is the best stab we currently have at a wintering range map. But if you look at the Nitros of the World book, which I apologize for the photo, this is actually a photo of my, my copy of this book, um, which has more detailed maps, you see mostly question marks on the wintering range. And again, that's because they get confused with those other nighthawk species. Well, why does it matter that we know where they migrate in winter? Well, remember I mentioned that we'd come back to those hypothesized mechanisms of decline. Well, here they are. These are the big ones. And we find that they all relate to more than just the breeding season. Uh, so the first hypothesis is that common nighthawks are, are no longer in the right place at the right time for peak food abundance, thanks to shifting seasons due to climate change. And this phenological mismatch is of particular concern for such a long distance migrant who's thought to be unable to assess these seasonal shifts because they travel so far. The second hypothesis is that agricultural pesticides reduce the availability of those aerial insects that they eat, which could happen anywhere throughout their annual cycle. The third hypothesis is that direct mortality from pesticides that may not be as well regulated in migratory or wintering areas um, as they are in the breeding counts here in Canada. So there's concern that perhaps individuals are being killed um, during migration or on their wintering grounds because of pesticides. And the fourth is increased storm frequency, which is of particular concern during migration, but could also affect common nighthawks anywhere throughout their annual cycle. 
So long story short, we need to know where common night hawks go so that we can start to assess some of these hypotheses. And so we used what's called a migratory network. And migratory networks are argued to be a good first step in evaluating causes of differential population trends like we're seeing in night hawks. A migratory network is basically a map of how birds on the breeding range connect with those same, uh, how those bird, same birds connect with their wintering range and on migration, which is also called migratory connectivity. Um, and so if birds all from one population on the breeding grounds all end up in the same place on the wintering grounds, we call that high connectivity. But if those birds all from one breeding area then disperse across the wintering range, we call that low connectivity. And so a couple great examples of migratory networks that have identified vulnerabilities either within the annual cycle or between populations uh, are purple martins and barn swallows shown here. And so we've set out to do just that and we've called it the, connect, uh, the Common Nighthawk Migratory Connectivity Project. So this past summer, um, we did, had a couple of trial seasons in 2015 and 2016 and then this past summer in 2017, uh, we worked with collaborators across the breeding range of the species to deploy uh, GPS tags on 63 different night hawks. And so these numbers on the map here are the number of tags that have been deployed at each of those locations. And the, the colored polygons on this map um, speak to that sort of uh, differential population trend approach that I mentioned in the last slide. So the, the color of the polygon is the um, sort of steepness of the population trend in that region according to BBS data. So red is bad and blue is good. The letter in the center of the polygon indicates whether that trend is significantly different from zero. And the way that we got these clusters is using a technique developed by Clark Rushing at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, um, where he takes uh, data from the breeding bird survey routes, he takes the um, abundance data as well as the trend data at the route level, and he uses a, a clustering technique and it basically sort of aggregates those routes into groups that have similar uh, demographic properties. And so the, the argument is that these polygons are uh, sort of natural subpopulations and, and they're much more relevant for conservation management. And so the idea is that we tried to deploy GPS tags in uh, natural subpopulations that spanned uh, a range of population trends so that we could start to look at correlates of those different population trends across their annual cycle. And so here are the, here's a little bit more about the technology. Uh, we used what's called a pinpoint GPS Argos tag that was recently developed by uh, Lotech Fish and Wildlife Monitoring in conjunction with BioTrack and SirTrack. And so these little tags are three and a half grams and it's the first time that something uh, affordable, relatively affordable, has been made this small and which is what enabled us to uh, start to look at common nighthawk migratory connectivity. So they're just three and a half grams. They have a short antenna, uh, which is the GPS antenna. And so they take about 30 to 60 GPS points uh, that we've scheduled across the annual cycle. So basically from early August through to the next June. They take GPS points with that short little antenna. And then what they do, what's really neat about these tags and what has made them work for common nighthawks is that they use that long antenna to connect to the Argo satellite. And they actually upload those GPS points directly to the Argo satellite. So we don't have to recapture these individuals anymore. Recapturing nighthawks can be really difficult. I've tried, Mark Brigham has tried. Um, if you don't understand their territoriality, they can be really hard to recapture because of that high mobility that we talked about in the second section. So these tags have been really, uh, really important in, in starting to understand the migratory connectivity of the common nighthawk. How do we put tags out? In other words, how do you catch a common nighthawk? I'm going to walk you through this section just because it's kind of neat. So step one, uh, you talk to Janet Ng. <laughs> you know, uh, this, the, the capture technique was developed by Janet Ng, and that's why I've used her photo here. Uh, but step one is you get uh, what's called Maurice, this um, sort of crude decoy that we use to catch common nighthawks that uh, Janet modeled. Uh, so you get, you get Maurice and then you go out into the field and you look for nighthawks. 
Uh, and then you find an area where um, you have a male that's wing blooming repeatedly and you go out um, and you set up mist nets and you put out your Maurice in your mist net and you set up some broadcast calls to bring that male in and you catch your Nighthawk. And step four, you take your Nighthawk and you measure all sorts of important things like wing cord and mass. Most importantly, you make sure that Nighthawk is big enough to put the tag on. So we work with a 5% weight threshold for these tags. Uh, so if we need a bird that weighs at least 70 grams to be able to put that tag on, and that's because we don't want to weigh them down too much, especially as a long distance migrant. Step five, you put your tag on, and then you let your night hunt go. And so I can't show you much data yet because the collection is still ongoing, but we have been getting tag transmissions, and this is a pretty exciting figure here. So we did put out um, eight, sorry, seven GPS tags uh, on the Saskatchewan side of Cypress Hills. And so we're keeping the larger data set secret for now, but I did think since this was a prairie talk, I should show you the Cypress Hills data. So of the seven individuals we, we tagged, we have tags, uh, six tags transmitting points. Those individuals appear to head southeast to the Gulf of Mexico, and then they sort of funnel down across the Caribbean islands or the Caribbean coast. They cross South America via Colombia, cross the Amazon, and then they settle in on wintering territories, primarily in Brazil. So you'll have to stay tuned for the bigger picture because like I said, the data collection is ongoing. We're still uh, only halfway through the annual cycle. These, these points that have been transmitted, uh, the birds are actually on their wintering grounds right now. So this is, it's pretty neat. It's, it's not quite real time data, uh, but for such a small species, it's pretty exciting that, that we can know this right now. Okay, moving on to problem four, um, the large range and so, I'm going to argue, hands down, the solution to the large range is collaboration. Uh, this section talks a little bit about the citizen science part of what I do, um, but I'd like to point out that collaboration has been an important part of all of these sections. Um, and so uh, I, think, I think it's really important for such a wide ranging species like Nighthawks where we make sure that we're, make sure that everyone is, is on the same page and we're working towards a common, a common goal. Uh, and so, I'm going to argue that citizen science as a form of collaboration um, has been really important in helping to collect additional data for this species. And so we know citizen science can cover a lot of ground. It's a solution that's been used time and again for studying species across their range. A couple of really known, well-known examples are the breeding bird survey, which we've mentioned a couple of times today, and the Christmas bird count, which is over 100 years old now. So citizen science is not new, but it's not today what it was 100 years ago. And technology has helped out a lot in this regard as well. So it's been argued by Silvertown and other authors that the existence of easily available technical tools are partly responsible for the recent explosion in citizen science activity in the last decade. A great example of these tools is the online Citizen Science Central hosted by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And so it's a huge uh, tool set that helps with the planning, development, and operation of citizen science programs. Now, one of the most important parts of citizen science is having a good protocol. Why? Because protocols allow for data collected by multiple observers to be pooled together for analysis. And so for night jars, including the common nighthawk, there have been multiple protocols used over the last decade or so. And so we got together a working group in over the winter of 2015 of nonprofit government and academic biologists to standardize existing nitro survey protocols here in Canada so that we could combine data across the country and contribute towards a data set that would cover the breeding range of the species. So we examined all the existing protocols for similarities and differences. And so that the main ones that we looked at were the, the protocol from the nitro survey network hosted by the Center for Conservation Biology, and that's in the US. Uh, we looked at uh, the Quebec Common Nighthawk and Eastern Whippoorwill Monitoring Program, and then we also looked at that citizen science program that I've been involved in, uh, which at this point in its development was called the BC NYCHA Survey. Uh, and so we examined those protocols, we looked for similarities and differences, and then we combined them with expert opinion into the new Canadian NYCHA Survey Protocol. In particular, we made sure that data collected with that new protocol could be integrated with some of the other big protocols that had been used in the past, or in the case of the US, that were still being used. So that NITRO survey network is still using their existing protocol. Uh, 
now that protocol is still in draft while well, we test run it with volunteers over the last couple of years, but it's working well. And so we're starting to get that working group together again uh, to talk about next steps for this program. So what is the protocol? I thought I'd give you a bit of a rundown. Basically, we survey for nitrous between June 15th and July 15th. If you're in an area where you might have one of the true nitrous species, so common poor whales or eastern whippoorwills, then we recommend that you survey within one week of the full moon because that's when they are more detectable. The surveys start at 30 minutes before sunset. Uh, they follow BBS routes, um, and so that's, it's a roadside survey. But instead of doing stops 1 through 50, we just do 12 stops. Um, and they're spaced 1.8 kilometers apart, or sorry, 1.6 kilometers apart instead of the 800 meter spacing. So it's basically every second BBS stop. So along a 12 stop route, and each, each uh, survey is a six minute survey. And so at Wild Research, the nonprofit that I run the citizen science surveys through, uh, we've implemented that national protocol as wide as we currently have capacity for, um, given that the Everything that we do is volunteer run at Wild Research. And so we've been coordinating surveys in six provinces and territories for the past couple of years and are hoping to add another two regions, Ontario and Nova Scotia, to that list for 2018. And surprise, surprise, we use technology to coordinate these surveys. So this is a screenshot of our primary tool. We call it the NightJar Atlas, and you can find it at nightjar.ca. The Atlas was built with funding from MEC, and it's hosted by the Community Mapping Network, and it helps us sign up volunteers, it allows those volunteers to access maps of their route, and it's also a data entry portal. And so that uh, takes the workload off of the folks who coordinate each of those regions and kind of spreads it out a little bit and it makes the program possible. So the Wild Research NHR survey has three main objectives for all NHR species uh, and an extra one for common nighthawks. The first objective is pretty straightforward, to collect baseline data across the range of the species, and we've done lots of that. So our volunteers have completed almost 8,000 NHR surveys to date, and that data is freely available on Nature Counts, although I believe it's not fully up to date right now. I'll have to check. Uh, the second objective is to contribute to determining survey methods. Um, and so we did use some of our data from earlier surveys in BC back when we were still developing the program when we put together that uh, National NHR Survey Protocol. And so I'll just show you a couple uh, basic examples that helped us uh, make decisions when we were putting together that protocol. So on the left, uh, we showed that common nighthawks are detected, uh, more common nighthawks are detected when you start your survey 30 minutes before sunset, as opposed to starting 30 minutes after sunset, which is um, what they do in the US under that nightshare survey network. We also showed that surveying within one week of the full moon does not affect the number of common nighthawk detections, unlike for some other species like the common poor whale. Our third objective is awareness and education. And again, I think this is a particularly one across that wide range. Uh, so we've had more than 500 volunteers um, involved in the program to date, and all of those volunteers uh, have learned more about the species through their participation in the program. We've had three interns um, between three months and six months since on the project that have learned a lot, as well as two undergraduate students that have actually used our data um, to start to learn more about the scientific method. And I'm gonna show you some results from those projects in just a minute here. Uh, we host orientation sessions every, um, at the beginning of every survey season, and that's a chance for folks to come out and actually uh, hopefully get to see an IHOC and, and learn the survey protocol in person before they go out and do their own survey. We do talks and guided tours. And then I also, uh, I write something called the Night Jar News. It's a bi-monthly newsletter, so every two months. And that, that's basically a way of disseminating any recent news about nighthawks that often has, and the other nightjar species that often has uh, any new science on nightjars in it. Uh, and so that's a way of reaching out to, I think somewhere around 450 people every two months um, about, about what's going on in terms of uh, the science and conservation of nightjar species in Canada and across the world. And so that last objective, uh, the common nighthawk specific objective, was to study some habitat associations. And so we've fulfilled that goal in three, way, three ways. First, we've contributed our sort of semi-national data set to a national data set of crepuscular or nocturnal surveys that's going to be used for common nighthawk critical habitat modeling. And I think this is the most important one. We've contributed data across that wide range use it that's been collected using a standardized protocol and that will be used to start to understand habitat associations of the species beyond open area. 
Um, the second is that um, we've had an undergraduate student at the University of Alberta examine whether common nighthawks are more or less abundant at roadside edges. And third, we've had another undergraduate at the University of Alberta build a habitat model for BC's grassland areas. And so it's of particular relevance to the prairie folks. Uh, so that first, uh, that first question, um, the edge effect study, this was conducted by Dr. Shaini Bhutpalan at the University of Alberta, and here's some of her preliminary results. She used ARU data for this instead of the citizen science, citizen science data, but this is ARU data collected by Wild Research. And in short, she found the common nighthawks are equally detected at ARUs adjacent to the road and 300 meters off the road, so the, we didn't find much of an edge effect um, on their habitat use. Uh, but she did find that cars passing by can affect detections of the on-road station. So it's something to think about uh, when we go back to that protocol again. And so that second undergraduate student, Alessandra Hood, uh, did use the citizen science data from Central BC uh, for her habitat model, and she specifically used the wing boom data. Uh, so in that protocol, we do differentiate between call and wing boom signals uh, because Alessandra wanted to look at territorial habitat. And so Alessandra used a modeling approach called N-mixture modeling to identify habitat features that were important for con uh, common nighthawk territoriality across two years of data, 2014 and 2015. And I apologize for this figure, uh, but I unfortunately had to take what she had done in her, uh, in her school report for this presentation. We are working towards publishing this, and so hopefully there will be a better figure in the future. Um, and so... Uh, basically, what she did is, is she took the, the environmental features that were important for both years and she pulled those out and she modeled with those. And interest, interestingly, she found is that the direction and the strength of those variables was similar between the two years, suggesting that Alessandra has identified the variables that are important for year-to-year -year territoriality for common nighthawks in southern BC. And I think one thing that's particularly important to point out is that one of the strongest predictors and most significant predictors was the amount of agriculture within 800 meters of the survey point, which negatively affected the number of territorial common nighthawks detected. So in other words, there are less territories in areas with lots of agriculture, which may or may not come as a surprise. I know some folks have reported common nighthawks nesting in agricultural areas and areas of their range, but it seems like in, in, um, in grassland areas in BC that that's not the case. And so I'm now working, like I mentioned, with both Dak Shaney and Alessandra to publish their results. And so hopefully we can share this work in further detail soon. And so to recap those four uh, challenges to studying common nighthawks that we've been working towards solving. The first challenge is their crepuscular nature. And I, I argue that bioacoustic technology uh, helps us uh, get past that. But I think also these citizen science surveys, the crepuscular surveys, have also helped us overcome that challenge. Their high mobility, um, I think some of this bioacoustic technology that we're developing will help us sort of tease apart those habitat functions and help us understand their habitat associations in more detail. Number three, other nighthawk species, well, the GPS technology and also a group of great collaborators has helped us uh, overcome that challenge and understand where common nighthawks uh, migrate and also where they overwinter. And then finally, that large geographic range, I think really um, citizen science has been great in helping us collect a data set that can cover such a large range, um, but I, I do also think that collaboration on all fronts is really important for uh, tackling that problem as well. And so a couple extra thanks uh, to both my supervisors, Aaron Bain and Mark Brigham, whose incredible support and wisdom has really helped me um, accomplish a lot, I think, and uh, um, yeah. I think continue to move forward, and also to Janet Ng, who really did pioneer a lot of uh, a lot of the basic work that has um, enabled some of these some of these solutions to the problems, especially that capture technique, and uh, also her just she just has an incredible amount of common I have knowledge that she's shared with me over the years. Um, and so if you're interested in knowing more about Nighthawks, you can always email me. You can follow me on Twitter. My Twitter feed is has a lot of NYCHAR content. Uh, you can also sign up for that NYCHAR news newsletter that I, that I talked about. Um, and if you're interested in surveying, you can either go to NYCHAR.ca and sign up for a route yourself, or you can contact uh, a regional coordinator in any of the prairie regions. We have a chapter in BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, and those email addresses are here. And that's it. Awesome, thank you very much, Ellie. That was a great presentation. Um, to all of our listeners out there,
If you have any questions, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. And um, there is a question here, Ali. Um, okay. You mentioned on just one of your recent slides, the predictors of common Nighthawk territories. And I was just wondering if you could clarify how you classified agriculture. Oh gosh, that's a good question. I'm, I have to go back to the data layers that we used. Um, I, I can't, I, you know what, I can't remember which agriculture layer we used right now. Um, but I remember that it included row crop as well as pasture. Okay. Um, so it was a pretty all-inclusive um, categorization. Okay, interesting. Um, and yeah, if you want to follow up with me, I'd be happy to dig that information out and we can talk more about it. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Ellie. Um, I would just like to remind our listeners out there that um, when you finish this webinar, you will receive an email uh, with a quick questionnaire. It just takes one minute. And if you don't mind filling it out, that gives us um, the leverage to continue getting funding for future webinars. So please take a minute to fill that out. And for all of our listeners, you're welcome to check out upcoming events on the PCAP website. That's www.pcap-sk.org. And you can click on Communications and Native Prairie Speaker Series, or you can click on the Events one for information about the Native Prairie Restoration and Reclamation Workshop. And I would just like to remind everyone that uh, PQ... PCAP has a YouTube channel, and you can check that out for a recording of this video in the near future, and you're welcome to pass that link on to anyone who could not be here today. And it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to, to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. And I would just also like to take a moment too to thank our sponsors for today's webinar, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Eco-Friendly SASC, SASTEL, Rancher Stewardship Alliance Inc., and Information Services Corporation. In-kind support has been provided by the University of Alberta. And since we don't have any more questions, I'd like to thank you very much, Ellie, for the really interesting and in-depth presentation. And I'd just like to thank all of our listeners for tuning in today. So thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Oh, thank you, Caitlin. Before we go, I do see a question just came in here. Good thing I didn't end it. <laughs> um, so a listener named Janet would like to know if you are aware of any surveys or studies of night jars in urban environments, such as cities. That's a great question. Uh, so there's a PhD student at the University of South Dakota who's working on uh, understanding the ecology of nighthawks that, roost, uh, sorry, that nest on rooftops. So one of the other hypothesized declines for the, um, the detected, or sorry, one of the other hypothesized mechanisms for the detected declines of the species, particularly in urban areas, is that the construction technology for roofs has changed where we no longer build gravel roofs that nighthawks like to nest on, uh, but instead use other building, uh, building techniques. And so uh, Gretchen Newberry is, is looking at a population of nighthawks that do still use those gravel roofs in South Dakota and uh, trying to understand their ecology. I believe there is also some potential upcoming work uh, that's going to happen for Rooftop nesting nighthawks in Toronto as well, uh, led by Bird Studies Canada, but I'm not sure what the status of that uh, that work is at this point. Hmm, that is really interesting. Thank you. I guess since we don't have any more questions, um, oh, Janet said that's awesome. She is located in Toronto, so perfect. Thank Great. That in, Janet. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much, Ellie, for the great presentation today, and um, I hope everyone has an awesome rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Caitlin.